In this video, we're going to consider factorising algebraic expressions. So when students first learn algebra, one of the first things they'll learn is to multiply out brackets. Later on, they'll learn to factorise back into brackets, which is definitely less popular, it's more difficult. There are different types, different challenges. But if you've got experience multiplying out brackets, that does help with factorising because essentially it is the reverse process. The other thing that makes factorising more difficult is the fact that you've got different types and even within the different types you've got different scenarios. So it's really difficult to get good at factorising straight away because it takes experience as well as technical skill. In this video we're going to look at the different types because it is a crucial part of the process to distinguish one type from the other and then we'll look at some of the techniques that you need to use within those types but ultimately it does take a little bit of practice. So what are the different types of factorising? Factorising, I should say, by the way, is a key skill, absolutely crucial skill for a bunch of different future math classes, not just um, algebra. So the three different types are common factor type factorising. So that's when you identify a common factor between the terms and then use that outside a bracket, outside one bracket. Then you've got a thing called a difference of two squares, which I'll explain more about in a moment. And then you've got these trinomials, remember tri means three, so one, two, three terms in descending powers of x, and that helps you, the fact that it's a trinomial, one, two, three, helps you identify that type. But the first type to really look out for, I think, are the, the common factors. They're the ones that most people learn, first of all. And indeed, even if you've got things that look like these types, or are those types, still look for a common factor, because you would want to do the common factor first, before you get to like the technique for this guy or the technique for this guy. So what does it mean to have a common factor? It means that within the terms in your expression there is a common term, either an x, like a letter term, or there's a number that divides into the numbers in each term. Sometimes a common factor is a number, sometimes it's a letter, sometimes it's a combination of both. Just depends on the expression, we'll see different examples here. And remember also that it doesn't have to be just two terms, it could be multiple terms, but usually common factor questions involve only two terms. So you're going to look at your two terms, or however many terms you've got, and try and identify that common factor. So if we look at this one here, we can see that there's an x in this term, but there's not an x in that term. So x is not common to both terms, so x is not the common factor. The common factor must then be based on the numbers. There's no number in each of these which is the same number, but there is a common divisor, like the highest number that divides into both 2 and 10 is 2, so that's your common factor. So it's not a letter in this case, it is a number, it's the highest number that divides into both 2 and 10, which is 2, so 2 goes outside our bracket. It's often the case with common factors as well that you can find multiple common factors, but there's always going to be one highest common factor, and that's the one that you need to aim for. So 2 is our common factor. How do we determine what goes in the bracket? Well, we imagine multiplying out the bracket because if you had something here, then that something times two needs to give you two x. So it has to be an x because two times x gives you two x. Something has to go here, two times something to give you 10. Well, that has to be a five because two times five gives you 10. So when you factorize into brackets, whether it's one bracket or later on we'll see two brackets, you can always check if you've got it right by then expanding out the bracket. 2 times x gives you 2x, so that one's definitely right. 2 times 5 gives you 10, so that one's right. Let's move on, take a look at the next example. So looking at the numbers here, there's no common factor between a 3 and a 2. That tells us there's going to be no numerical part to our common factor in this question. There is an x in both uh, terms though, so x will be our common factor. It's our highest common factor. Let's put the x outside the bracket. I would recommend just putting down your common factor writing down your bracket and then figuring out what goes inside. x times something to give you 3x squared. Well, definitely need to be a 3 there, but 3 times x would only be 3x, so we need another x to make it a 3x squared. x times something to give you 2x, that's going to have to be a 2, because x times 2 gives you 2x. So hopefully that it kind of demonstrates how we think about these question types. Let's take a look at the next one. Slightly more complex, um, well, maybe not much more complex, fairly similar, I guess, just slightly higher numbers. So here we can see immediately there's an x in both terms. 
So that's going to play a part in our common factor. We can also see that the 5 divides into both 5 and 15. So that tells us that 5 is part of our common factor. x is also our common factor. So therefore, 5x is actually our highest common factor. So you could use 5 as a common factor, just the number 5. You could use x as a common factor. Neither of those are the highest common factor, so we want to use 5x. Open in our bracket and thinking about what goes inside. So 5x times something to give you 5x squared, that would need to be an x. 5x times something to give you 15x, that would need to be a 3. So it just becomes plus 3 like that. So a few different types there, but all relying upon the same technique, the overall technique, which is a common factor. And only using one bracket, that's really important as well. The next type is called a difference of two squares. It's a very recognizable form. The trinomials are also very recognizable. This one sometimes does look like these ones. For example, if that had been a minus, it might not look a million miles away from some of these, but you've got to be careful about distinguishing them. So a difference of two squares literally means something squared minus something squared. Difference in mathematics means minus, subtract, take away. So here we've got x squared minus. This doesn't have a square on it, but it is the number three squared. So you'll often see square numbers in these questions. So look out for numbers like four, nine, 16, 25. All the numbers that are square rootable are the square numbers. So x squared minus 9, which is basically 3 squared, that's a classic form for a difference of two squares, this type. Difference of two squares works by two brackets. And basically it's a very simple process. Once you've identified it as a difference of squares, whatever goes here and here has to be the same, and they've got to multiply to make the x squared, and whatever goes here and here has to be the same and multiply to make the minus 9. The only way to make the x squared would be an x and an x. The way to make a 9, assuming these need to be the same number, is going to be the square root of 9, which is 3. So it's going to be 3 and 3. And the way that these work, you always have 1 plus and 1 minus. It doesn't matter if you go plus, minus, or minus, plus. There's no convention for that. But the key is these have to be the same, and they have to be the same. If you wanted to check it, you would multiply out the brackets using FOIL, or some technique they use for multiplying out brackets, which would give you x times x, which gives you x squared, x times negative 3 gives you minus 3x, 3 times x gives you positive 3x, and then 3 times minus 3 gives you minus 9. But notice what happens with the middle two terms. There's one positive, there's one negative, they cancel, and that's why you need a plus and a minus. That leaves you just with x squared minus 9, which is what we wanted, so that tells us we've got our factorising correct. Let's look at the next one. 25 minus x squared. First of all, is that a difference of squares? It is. 25 is a square number, it's 5 squared minus a square thing. This, time's a, this time the terms are the other way around, but we still need two brackets. We still need these things and these things to be the same. Just need to change the order. First of all, we've got the number, so we're going to put the number first in our brackets. To make the x squared again, we need an x and an x. We need 1 plus and 1 minus. And that's basically straight to the answer. The differences of squares, once you get used to them, should be really quick. It's just recognizing them that is the challenge at first. Okay, so the, the last one's a little bit more complicated, but a fairly common form. So it's not just an x squared this time, it's a 4x squared, but 4x squared is 2x all squared. So as long as this is something squared, and that is something squared, which is obviously 7 squared, then that works. So even in these ones, this number, if it's a number times x squared, this would need to be a square number as well. So a similar process, we go for our two brackets. We put in our uh, 2x and 2x in this case. You can never have like 2x and 3x, they have to be the same thing. Otherwise you wouldn't get this cancellation part in the middle when you expand the bracket. 7 and 7, and again 1 plus and 1 minus. This gives you a 4x squared, that gives you a minus 49. If you expanded the bracket you would get a positive 14x a minus 14x, but that positive and minus 14x would just cancel. That's why there's no x term here, only an x squared and a number term. So a quick recap, these are common factors, these are differences of squares, and the final type we want to concern ourselves with, the most difficult type probably, are the trinomials. Easy to recognize because they're going to have an x squared term, an x term, and a number term, always. Sometimes you'll get numbers in front of the x squared term like this one, which make them significantly more difficult. But the overall process is the same. And again, the overall goal is the same. Get it into brackets 
so that if you've got the brackets correct, if you then expanded, multiplied out those brackets, you would go back to where you started. So these ones, trinomials, also work by two brackets. They're kind of um, similar to these, or these you could say are a special case really of these. These are trinomials without the x term in the middle, kind of. So we work in a similar way. We need to make an x squared, which we're going to make by an x and an x. So always put in the, um, well, first of all, I would say with these, always writing down your two brackets, physically write them down. If it's an x squared, which most of them are, um, some of them have got numbers in front, but generally, mostly you'll see just an x squared. Just put in the x and the x, because you know that they belong there, they have to be there, so it's a no-brainer just to go ahead and write those in. And the way these trinomials work, and it does cause a lot of confusion at first, I'm not going to lie, it takes a bit of experience. The numbers you choose here and here, they've got to multiply to make this number, and they've got to combine, which is going to be an add or a subtract, but I prefer the word combine, to make the middle number. So trying to think, right, what numbers multiply to make 15? Well, you could have 15 times 1. The other option, would on, the only other option would be 5 and 3. We want to be able to use the combination that both multiplies to make 15, but also adds or subtracts to make an 8. Well, 15 and a 1, you could only ever make a, like a 14 or a 16. You couldn't make an 8 out of those two numbers. So it has to be a 5 and a 3. So I'm just going to put the 5 here and the 3 there. It doesn't matter which way you put the 5 and the 3. The more important thing is to get the plus and the minus correct. In this case, it's going to be plus plus because positive 5 times positive 3 gives you 15. Positive 15. And positive 5 plus positive 3 gives you positive 8. Again, this would be the end of the question, but you could check it by multiplying out the brackets. Uh, you don't generally do this, but it's, you can do it to check. So x times x gives you x squared. This is just like what we did over here to check it. x times 3 gives you 3x. 5 times x gives you 5x. 5 times 3 gives you 15. And then you can see the middle two terms are going to combine to give you an 8x. That's why we consider the combining of the numbers earlier on. And that gives us what we were starting with. So that basically tells us that we've got that one right. We're doing that check which I wouldn't recommend you do every time, but do it if you're just learning how to do these, just to get going. The thing that makes a trinomial more difficult, well, two things. One, if there's a number there. Secondly, if you've got pluses and minuses kicking about, you need to think more carefully about the signs. But the important thing to take away from this video, the process doesn't really change. You just need to be more careful with the numeracy part. So again, we need two brackets because it's a trinomial. We can put in our x and our x. And notice at that point, we're already like halfway there. Just need to get our numbers. So think about the numbers and multiply to make 8. And it's good practice if you wish when you're starting just to write these down. So 8 times 1 or 4 times 2. As that end number gets higher, it's going to be more challenging to recognize all the combinations and to check them. But we're trying to make a 6 in the middle. Now an 8 and a 1, again, it can't make a 6. It can only make a 9 or a 7. So it's definitely not the 8 and the 1. We can discard that like we could discard the 15 and the 1. So it has to be the 4 and the 2. So just write in the 4 and the 2. Now we need to refine our plus minus a little. So we want these to multiply together to make plus 8, but combine this time to make a negative 6. So the only options to make a positive 8 would be plus plus or minus minus, because if you multiply two negatives, you also get a positive. If we did do plus plus, they would multiply to make plus 8, so that would be fine. But positive 4 plus 2 gives you positive 6, which doesn't work for that second criteria. So we're going to need minus minus. So minus 4 times minus 2 gives you plus 8. Minus 4 minus 2 gives you minus 6. And again, you could check this by multiplying out the brackets. But essentially, you don't really have to. If you've done a few of these, you'll realize that it's just about checking the number combination. Minus 4 minus 2 gives you minus 6. Minus 4 times minus 2 gives you plus 8. The more difficult scenario is the final one there, when it's got a number in front of the x squared. It does slightly change how you've got to think about them, but it is essentially overall the same um, kind of process. So again, stick down your two brackets. To make a 2x squared, we can't use an x and an x this time. This time we'll need a 2x and an x. That 2 plays a big role in these questions and causes a lot of problems. So that's going to give us our 2x squared. We still need two numbers that multiply to make 12. So again, we could go through our, our check. So 12 and 1, 6 and 2, or in this case, 4 and 3. The thing that makes these more difficult 
whatever number goes here is eventually, if you were multiplying out the brackets, eventually at some point will multiply to the 2x, which means the number is getting doubled, which means it's more difficult to make the, the internal number, the 11x in this case. Because up here, for example, 5 times 3 gave us 15, 5 plus 3 gave us 8. That's quite intuitive. But here it's going to be number times number to give you 12, number times number times 2 to give you 11. So there's an added bit of complexity. I've seen students attempt these in so many different ways. There's so many different techniques. But with having watched hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students try these, I've concluded the best way is trial and error. You can draw little tables, you can do all sorts of things. Trial and error is not a bad way. If you're doing trial and error, discount this option first. It's hardly ever going to be the number times one. We might need to use it, but make it your last check. So I would recommend checking the other two numbers first. So if you were to put a 6 here and a 2 here, they would multiply to make 12. That would give you a 6 there and a 2 there. 2 times 2 would give you a 4. 4 plus 6 doesn't give you 10. That tells us that doesn't work. But with these ones, you need to check it the other way around as well. Didn't have to do that here because 3 times 5 or 5 times 3 both gives you 15. In this case, we need to check it more carefully. So the other way around would be a 6 here and a 2 here. 6 times 2 gives you 12, plus 2 gives you 14. Again, that's not 11, so we can discard that one. So just write the, I'm not writing the numbers in because I'm on the whiteboard, but just write your numbers in and check them one at a time. You could try the 12 and the 1 to start with, but it's unlikely to be that one. So trying the 4 and the 3, if we were to put the 3 here and the 4 here, they would multiply to make the 12, that's fine. 3 times 2 gives you 6, plus the 4 that would be here gives you 10. So that's not worked. So now we need to try that the other way, which would be um, a 3 here and a 4 here. 4 times 3 gives you, sorry, 4 times 2 gives you 8. 8 plus 3 does give you 11, and 3 times 4 still gives you 12. So that would be the, the winning combination for this one. So you can see this is significantly more complex than these two. And I'll be honest with you, having worked hundreds and hundreds of these questions with many students, they just are tough. Like, no one loves them, no one gets them straight away. They take a bit of practice and a bit of playing around with. But do just try, do them by trial and error. I think that is the, the way to go. So 4 and 3 in this case, and that would be the, the full factorization. I would recommend as well putting the number term here. You don't have to. You can put the 2x there if you wish. If that's the way you've learned it, then that's fair enough. But generally, the convention is to put it here. And generally, that works out better when you're trying to figure out the numbers. So a quick recap then. Factorizing is not easy. It does take practice and experience. You've got these three different types. You're always scanning your question to ask yourself, which type am I dealing with? Once you've got the type down, then working on these individual techniques. Always check the common factor first, because you'll see cases that start off with a common factor, and then later on they might turn into like a difference of squares. Or even you could have a trinomial that's got a common factor. If you remove the common factor first, it makes the factorizing a lot more uh, straightforward. Okay, so uh, factorizing a key skill in mathematics in all levels. So when you're starting algebra, when you're solving equations, when you're doing calculus, it doesn't matter how far you go, you'll always yeah, use factorizing. It's just a super critical, super common skill. So the better you can get this down now, just the easier it's going to make things in the future.